This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're on part 89 of Understanding the Kingdom, and I remember, in fact, I'm in, in the process of downloading uh, all of our older videos off of YouTube and didn't realize that I started this series in 2015. <laughs> and uh, in fact, after I think we hit about 10, I think, I think this thing's just going to keep on going. And one guy wrote me and said, oh, please go to 100. I think we may hit that request. But there's so much in the kingdom that we've not been taught. There's so much in the kingdom that, uh, that we're not walking in. You know, back in uh, December, I was filming at Skywatch TV, and they asked me, we're talking about power levels, how much of our authority in different things we are walking in, and I, I think they kind of, I kind of shocked them, you know, on a scale of one to 10, where are we? And uh, I said, two, and you could have heard a pin drop. But when I compare it to the book of Acts, when I compare it to the level of authority that I know we're going to need in the days ahead, we're operating at a two. And that's on a good day. That's on a good day. And so I, I want to deal with some things that I'm seeing from Scripture that uh, we, are, we need to be preparing for Pentecost, the fire of God to fall. And we also need to learn how to maintain that power. You know, it's one thing to get the fire. It's another thing to be able to maintain the fire. And historically, probably over the last 1950, 1960, we referred to the wave of the Holy Spirit. You know, like a tidal wave coming in. But what that has done is we have a bunch of surfers out there just waiting on the next wave to come. And they're not doing anything except sitting and waiting. I'm just waiting on the, I'm, I'm the big kahuna, and I'm waiting for the next wave so I can launch my ministry. Guys, if there was ever a time that we needed a visitation from Almighty God, it's right now. America is in the middle of a Marxist revolution, and it's got a big part of our government. We just had 120 flag-level officers, that's admirals and generals that were retired, that, said, that basically said that, that this is one of the greatest times our republic has ever been in jeopardy. And the church is clueless. The only thing, because this thing is spiritual, there is a demonic spiritual power behind Marxism, and it's fueled by anger and rage. Now they may paint it as utopic, they can't point to one utopia that they've done, but you can point to hell on earth when you look at the millions that Stalin killed of his own citizens or the mi millions that Mao killed of his own citizens because it is a worship of the state that the state owns everything and you get nothing. For those that have been told the wonders of socialism, Years ago when I was in the military in Germany, I actually got to go up and do a tour of Berlin. Berlin, it was kind of like a TDY kind of thing where you were off. And I actually got to go over to East Berlin that back then was communist. 
and they would share about the housing that they would just, it was cookie cutter, that they were all the same, all the, all the rooms that they built for like the apartment complexes, all of them were the same size room, and they would just cut out doorways where you wanted a bedroom or whatever. The life expectancy of that apartment complex was 25 years, that it would eventually collapse in on itself. That's socialism. Or if you wanted a vehicle, you had to, you couldn't go out and buy a vehicle. The government had to give it to you, and it could take up to seven years to get one. So you're a family of five, and you put into the government for a minivan, they may give you a two-seat vehicle, because it's whatever the government has handy, and some bureaucrat signs off and says, no, you only get one so all your kids can stay at home while you go shopping. If you can get food, I mean, we know the horrors about waiting a day in line for a loaf of bread and a jug of milk, that's socialism. The, and it's spiritual. There is a spirit behind it. I pointed this out in, in my first book, The Shine Our Directive, that communism is one step away from Luciferianism. You go from worshiping the state to being wanting to be worshiped as a god. And many of their leaders are. They're, they're deified, just like the old Caesars or Nimrod or the ones that we see throughout history. And if it is a supernatural force behind it, the only thing that can stop it is the supernatural power and the fire of God amongst his people. Is the only thing that can stop a spiritual force from hell is the army of the living God. So if there was ever time we needed a visitation, it's right now. If there was ever time that we needed a supernatural empowerment from heaven, it is right now. But what I have discovered as I study the Word and as I have studied revival history, it never happened in a vacuum. They weren't going around going, doop a doop a Oh, Revival! Never happened. Even in Jonathan Edwards' revival, it was because he was seeking the face of God, and there were those seeking the face of God that caused that day for that power to be poured out. Charles Finney, when he would go, he would have a man go before him that sometimes would go into an area, and he would pray up to a year before Finney got there. He would telegraph Finney and say, now it's ripe for revival. The prayer work has been done. Heaven will not act until we're prepared. You know, we were discussing some things on the podcast this week about small is the gate and narrow is the path. And I didn't realize just how narrow that gate was. You know, I'm thinking of a gate, you know, this is a narrow gate, this is a wide gate. In the original Greek, it's stenos, means narrow. But it's derived, its root word is steno, which means to grow into sigh. Now, only big boys understand this. Every once in a while, you get in a situation where you got to grow and sigh and 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 squeeze to get through. Only big big boys understand that you go someplace and and three foot meets a two and a half foot opening and you're trying to suck it up and jockey it through. I remember years ago, and I was just a kid. We went down to Silver Dollar City, went down into the caverns. And uh, they need to tell you if you're a fat boy, you don't need to go. Because there are some places, I mean, I was skinny and I was getting claustrophobic. I mean, I, I, was, I was a walking bean pole. And there was one guy that actually had to turn back. He almost got stuck. Okay. He was sighing and he was groaning to squeeze through. That's what Jesus said about the kingdom. When he said, little is that gate, he was talking about a shepherd's going to try to poke through where only a, a, a skinny sheep can get through. You say, why are you saying this? Because he said, narrow is the way, compressed is this way. It actually gets smaller on the other side of the gate. But that's where the abundant living is. We want to talk about going through the gate, and then once you get through that gate, it's a 16-lane highway. No, it's not. It's a dog trail, about like this. 
And then other people get envious. How come they're blessed to God? How come this and how come that and how come this? We even have the, the tale of, of white privilege that's going on in, in today. And there, there is, when you, when you deal at a, with a culture that was based upon what they call wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, there might be a little, but I was raised poor, okay? I remember as a kid, my mom would eat toast for dinner and I'd have a can of Campbell's soup. I remember when thinking that going to McDonald's, that's what the rich did as a kid. There was a time in my kid's childhood where all food came in a yellow can and it said, always saves. Ketchup was the consistency of tomato juice. Okay. They just add a little bit of flavoring to it. All of us have been there. But when somebody, because I, I know of our brothers and sisters, whether they're in the Asian community or African American community, are doing far better than I am. And right now I'm blessed of God, but I mean they're doing far better. Why? They have learned how to walk in that narrow trail long before Mary and I did. And they understood the dynamics of it. And they understood what it means to walk in excellence. I remember I've got a daughter in the faith. She's a, a bishop with her husband down in, in Atlanta. And uh, she's a spiritual mother in that church. There was a young guy that's just now getting right with God and trying to get his life together. And she says, not only are you going to get a job, you're going to let me know that you get the job, and we're going to get you a cell phone, and you're going to call me at least every other day to let me know what you're doing and that you're staying straight and that you're, you're not drinking, you're not smoking, or whatever it was. And you're going to meet with me once a week in here. And then I'm going to talk to your boss to make sure that you're doing the job. Accountability. What was she doing? You can be out here with the devil devouring you, or I'm going to try to help you find that narrow path that comes with blessing. And that was one of the greatest benefits that she could have ever done for that young man. And when you look at that church, they have done it over and over and over again. I remember one, uh, one weekend they had me down there, and they were taking communion. And it was literally, the Marines would have been proud. I mean, it was, like, it was like military precision and cadence that they passed out that communion. I mean, they did everything but the, the snapping like you would when you twisted and stuff when you're military and you're on parade. I mean, it, it was, I was, my jaw dropped. These guys, I mean, they were serious. This was to honor God. They were serious about it. But there were men and women that, just like in New York, one of the first times I went up there, a beautiful young lady, this the glow of God was all over her. I was introduced to introduce me, and, and I was told she's their corporate attorney for the ministry. She used to be a prostitute, strung out on drugs, found Jesus. Didn't play with greasy grace. She got on in there and is totally sold out to God. Got off of drugs, got off the street, paid her way through college, and then began earning such grades that she began getting some scholarships. And now she was an attorney for God. That's the kingdom. And that's what we need in this, in this era. And we're, we're preaching it like it's a 16-lane highway. As, and let me tell you something, the worse the world gets, the narrower the path becomes. All the great men of God knew this. Those that have moved in supernatural power understood just how narrow that path was. But that's something that we have forgotten. You know, in the very first Pentecost, and this is found in Exodus chapter 19, I've not even gotten past my introduction yet. Is that okay? Acts chapter, or Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 through 13. You see, the very first Pentecost wasn't in the book of Acts. It's in the book of Exodus. It's when God set the mountain on fire. God brought them out of Egypt with a high and mighty hand. And I can imagine Moses wanting to take them up there and say, listen, if we go up to the mountain, there's a really cool burning bush that's never consumed, and it just burns. 
God had another idea. We pick up in verse 10. And the Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set boundaries for the people round about, saying, Beware that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches this mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch it, but he shall surely be stoned and shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. And when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they came up to the mountain. You want to talk about setting boundaries on the path. Now this is something that's holy. And when the fire of God shows up, there better be preparation and there better be boundaries. And those boundaries are set by the commandments of God. Not greasy grace. Theologians will point to these verses. John the Baptist did not create something called baptism. Moses did. That this was a baptism. They, when, they, when they met with God, there was a cleansing process so that not even any of their clothes would have the dust or smell of Egypt on them, that they would stand before him with no stench of Egypt, but stand as a free people. How much are we being taught today to let the blood of Jesus do its work? It's not a 30-second event. There will be times of great consecration, of casting out the rocks, throwing every weight aside that so easily besets us. And let me tell you something. The world is like fungus. It'll creep in on you. It's sneaky. It'll show up in the corners and it'll just try to take over. That's when we need to have assessment being done to cleanse and get rid of these things. If Jesus would show up today and he would physically come into our homes, how much, if we had foreknowledge, how many of us would do a real spring cleaning before he got there? Here's the truth, he's already there. I mean, I'm, I'm, God has been dealing with me with so much stuff. Things have got to change, all of us. Things have got to change. They've got to change. I'm, I'm willing to jettison anything that would stop me from moving in the things of God the way that I need to. And you got to, when you get rid of something, you got to replace it with something of the kingdom. Don't just create empty space. Nature abhors a void. And the devil looks at it like, there's room for me to be. You've got to fill it with God. You've got to fill it with the kingdom. So here they are washing. Here the, and God sets the boundaries. And when he comes down, that, he sets the mountain on fire. And Ron Wyatt found the right mountain that you can go to today. And the entire top of it is scorched as if a blowtorch was set on top of it to this day. And that's the kind of fire that we're asking God for. There has to be a time of cleansing and a, and a time of setting boundaries. Moses said also three days. Why three days? It was prophetic before Jonah that Messiah would spend three days in the earth. And Christians need to learn how to count, not a day and a half. There's nothing good about that Friday. That was Dagon's day. That's why you eat fish. Jesus died before sunset on a Wednesday. That's when that Passover was. He was in the ground three full days. Although we can't count, God can. Okay? And sometime between Saturday night and Sunday morning, Jesus raised from the dead. The Bible says, while it was yet dark, the tomb was empty. So let me ask you this. How do we get a sunrise service when it was still dark and the tomb was empty? 
Uh-oh. Oh, are you going to get into that? No, that's just free. Just make you start doing some of your whole research. What's interesting is three is the number of resurrection, divine completeness, and perfection or maturity. But here's the thing. You've got to have a death before you can have a resurrection. You move in the new man to the same proportion that you crucify the old man. If you crucify 20% of the old man, you get to walk in 20% of the new man. There needs to be more crucifixions going on in the body of Christ right now. We've got to crucify a lot of things so that we can function in that new man the way that we're supposed to. The times demand it. All of the nations around the earth are crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. Not this techno-sorcery babble that's being hoisted on us today. In preparation for a visitation from Almighty God, there needs to be a deep cleaning of repentance and self-examination within the body of Christ. Notice I said self-examination. You're not to examine your mate. You're not to examine your neighbor. You're not to examine those around you. It is self-introspection. Holy Spirit, turn the light on me. We may need to be forgiving others for past wrongs. If someone, if we've wronged someone, I'm just going to put that under the blood, brother. God may require you to go make it right. That's what, remember when Jesus said, if you bring your offering to the altar, remember you have ought against your brother? Well, he was talking about a guilt offering. You got to go make it right before you can give the guilt offering. So there are going to be times when we, let's say if you were a thief before you got saved, you may need to go make some things right. Oh, we don't like hearing that. We just want to go down and say, Lord, forgive me. Now it's over. We need to make it right. We need to be examining our attitudes, mindsets, and looking for landmine strongholds. Lies of the past that you bought as truth. One of the interesting things, when Jesus came to give us authority, that's exousia in the Greek, that we translate authority. But if you look it up in a good lexicon, its number one definition is power of choice. You see, before, you couldn't choose. It was just you being you, the old you, the old ugly you being you, and you really didn't think there was any other way to be because that was you. And all the lies that you picked up along the way. Because they were being them, the old man. Stuck on evil, stuck on stupid, stuck on whatever they were stuck on. That they were motivated by a demon to lie to you, to wound you, to whatever it was. Now as a believer, I look at that stronghold and now I have the authority to question that stronghold. And call it out for the lie that it is. And that lie is no longer going to control me on any level. Conscious, unconscious, subconscious. I don't care. I'm calling it out as a liar. And I'm going to begin speaking the truth in my life in that area. Until God pulls down that stronghold. I beat it to a pulp with the word of God. And God's word replaces it. And now I have a fortress for my God. Built on truth. That may take some work. Maybe it only take work if you're like me. I'm, I tend to be pretty boneheaded. But sometimes the bigger the, fort, the bigger the stronghold, the more you got to smash it to pieces and the longer it takes because its roots run deep. I mean, it's worse than dandelions. <laughs> now, there have been a few weeds I think I've pulled that I'd, there, there's something tugging on the other side in China. It feels like it's just that deep. That especially happens if it was happened to something that was when you were young. And it raises up as a big flag in the, in the spirit. And every demon in hell that ever came across your way reinforced that lie. But you have the right. You have the authority to call it out for what it is and to pull it out of your life. And to fill that hole with the truth of God's word. So that it can never grow back. 
Guys, we got to cast out ungodly influences. What's influencing us? If you think the evening news ought to have any influence in your life, I've got a bridge I can sell you in Brooklyn. Okay? Our beachfront property in Nebraska. We have got to understand the difference between propaganda and truth. The only reason that Mary and I usually watch any of the news to see what the new propaganda is and what their agenda is and what the trigger words for those that are involved in mind control are that week. About the only thing that I really consider is truth and it's the only right 50% of the time is the weather report. They can't get that right. I remember growing up as a kid and listening to the radio, and I mean, it's storming, and this, I mean, the, wind, the rain's almost going sideways, and I'm sitting there listening to, to KMOX in St. Louis. They said, it's going to be sunny today, and no chance of rain. Wait a minute. My producer just told me it's a storm outside. How about that? <laughs> I remember that. I'm thinking, boy, sometimes it, it's just about like that now. And guys, we have got to be actively inviting the Holy Spirit to take over. He'll take over if you invite him. He's a gentleman. He wants to work with your will. If you set your will to be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will work with you to fill up every area of your life. But I I mean, it comes a time that we just got to, because we Greco-Romans like to compartmentalize. Do you ever have... A house that, I mean, it looked really good in the living room and the kitchen looked really good, but you always had that one back bedroom or basement or back bedrooms that it was, that was your secret place to hoard things. <laughs> and it just piles up. And company, when they came, never saw those rooms. When the Holy Spirit enters into a house, what I have found out is he'll walk right up to that door and just stand there. I'm not interested in the kitchen. It's clean. I'm not interested in the living room. It's clean. But you know there's this one door that you've closed off to me. And I'm just going to patiently stand here and wait until you open the door and you invite me in because it's only going to get clean by my power. Guys, we need, to, we need to understand that. We have got to set boundaries. Boundaries to two things. It either keeps things out or it keeps things in. I want to keep in the blessings of God, and I want to keep out what the enemy is doing. God is calling us to establish biblical boundaries in our lives that we will not cross, nor will we allow the things of the enemy to enter in. Boundaries to be effective must be guarded. When Almighty God told Adam to keep the garden, that's to guard the boundaries, keep the things out. And we're told to do that. We're told to keep the feasts and keep the commandments. We're not only to observe them, but we're to keep them from being tainted by Mystery Babylon, which Israel over and over again was guilty of doing. That's when you can keep them, but you're not really keeping them. That's why in the Word we see in the prophets that God finally said, I'm sick of your feasts. I can't stomach them anymore. And us Christians in the 21st century read that and say, see, God did away with his feasts. No, he said, I can't stomach your feasts. Not my feast, your feast, what you have done with them. I can't stomach because you didn't set boundaries up around them and keep them pure. And the next thing you know, you got weeping for Tammuz in the middle of it. You got, you got Baal going off over here and this going off over here with the veneer of walking with God. Boy, haven't we done that in so many ways. We have the veneer, but there's no reality to it because the, when you pull the veneer back, it's all mystery Babylon, and we're calling it church. We've got to set the boundaries. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 30. 
I thought this Elijah Mount Carmel moment was very appropriate because every night on the evening news you have the prophets of Baal. We have Marxist prophets of Baal in our universities turning our kids into Marxists. We have politicians that are promoting Marxism. They won't tell you that, but that's exactly what it is. It's like the idea for us in America. They're now postulating. They're trying to soft sell it. The Constitution is just an idea. No, it's not. It's an absolute. And government, it's there to keep you in certain boundaries, not us. We, the people, set the boundaries because we knew the evil of government that was, not in, that was out of control. But it's just an idea. You're not guaranteed. Yeah, I am guaranteed. If I am a citizen of the United States, I am guaranteed my constitutional rights. You say, well, Mike, why are you bringing up that? Because we have done the exact same thing with the Word of God. Well, you know the commandments of God, the law of God, you know it's been done away with. So I can lie now, I can commit adultery now, I can kill now, I can do whatever I want now, because Jesus made it no longer sin. That is being, in, in fact, I think that it was the, that the Masonic and, and, the, and the Marxist influence that pushed that into the church. The great revivals of God, they all revered Moses. All of them. There's not a single true revival in the church ever that they did not revere the commandments of God. And now we have people going around saying, Jesus conquered Moses. Dude, they're best friends. Moses showed up to his transfiguration. God kept a promise. God says, I'm going to show you my glory. And you know when he passed by him in the cleft of the rock, he had his hand over his face. He didn't get to see the glory. He just got to see the backside as Jesus passed by. But he said, I'm going to keep my word. And so Jesus came down and he took on flesh. And in the moment that he went ahead and turned off the dimmer switch, and he was transfigured in his glory, not only were there three disciples there, but there was Moses and Elijah. Whew. How many thousands of years was it that Moses waited in heaven saying, there's going to be a time I'm going to be in the earth and I'm going to see his glory. And that day he stared at the face of the glorified Messiah. And Peter says, we're going to take this clear through tabernacles. I'm building a sukkah for everybody. <laughs> Why are you saying that? Because God keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. And Elijah had a showdown with the prophets of Baal. Let's pick up here in verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. Number one, he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. The altar of the Lord has been torn down in America. We've replaced it with the prophets of Baal hooping and hollering and I'm waiting for them to start cutting themselves. In fact, David Wilkinson saw where one day around the altar they were going to be dancing naked in, in his, th his book, The Vision. That's how debase that the church is going to be in many sectors. You know, you read the vision and you just weep. How could we let it get this far? How could, Israel, how could Israel allow the prophets of Baal to sit around the king's table? But then I look at our current administration. Same thing. 
The prophets of Baal are gathering, so there's going to have to be the spirit of Elijah released upon the people of God. And there's going to have to be in this day and in this hour, this Elijah Mount Carmel moment in the body of Christ. So he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. 12 is the number of divine government to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench round about, around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. And then he arranged the wood and cut the ox into pieces and laid it on the wood. Now the King James says he set things in order. If there was ever a time, you see, when you repair the altar, then you can set things in order. The fire is not going to fall where the altar has not been rebuilt and the sacrifice has been prepared. Well, then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And then they did it a third time. Well, there's that three again, isn't there? We're going, to, we're going to experience a resurrection, a supernatural power from God. And at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, timing was everything. He was not moving according to the appointment of his times, but God's time. That's why recognition of the times of God are so important. When it came that evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back again. He was doing it for the people. Elijah didn't say, Lord, I need fire to fall so that the Christian television networks would come and I can launch my ministry. It wasn't about Elijah. It was about God, his honor, and what the people of God needed. And when that becomes paramount in ministry, fire will begin to fall again. I am not at all seeker-friendly. I could care less. <laughs> no, Mike, I never noticed that about you. Yeah, you have. <laughs> I, I, ha I have a natural inclination to rub people the wrong way if you give me half a chance, okay? But I am God-sensitive, and I think that's what we need to be. God, what do you want? Seeker-sensitive puts the, the carnal needs of the people in the front row. It puts it in the driver's seat. Well, that's the only way that you're going to build a mega ministry. Well, if it's a mega ministry and everybody was going to hell, it was useless to begin with. Lord, have we not built great auditoriums in your name? Have we not built great hospitals in your name? Have we not went and painted every high school in, in the country in your name? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of sin, of iniquity. But when it's God's honor... And what the people really need. You know, Ebenezer, let's just get along with the prophets of Baal. Come on now, we're causing division in the body. It's just causing division. You see, in this contest, somebody was going to lose their head. Either Elijah or 400 prophets of Baal. Heads were going to roll. I mean, they were serious about their occult work. The interesting thing is when you, when you had a man of God come in that his heart was for God and he knew that Israel needed to return to God, he was willing to lay down his life for that. He was willing to rebuild the altar no matter how mad it made them. And what, what's interesting, he confronts them in a situation that the prophets of Baal had to allow him to rebuild the altar. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, come on, not like Gideon that he went and did it when he did it at night so that his, his dad's friends wouldn't kill him over it. Out there in broad daylight, rebuilt it, established divine government, set things in order God's way, the way that God likes it. And then we have three that three times he threw water over it so that nobody could flick their bick and have fakery going on. That when the fire of God came, it licked up everything. There was, in nobody's mind was it, well, he just used some shenanigans, you know. And that's been done in ministry. I remember years ago, there was a woman that uh, she would have angel's feathers or Holy Spirit feathers and anointing oil and all this stuff. This drip from her fingertips and fly in the air until Willie George caught it on tape that it was all a sham. And do you know who the one that got persecuted was? Willie George. Why? Because it really screwed up the gravy train. Elijah didn't care about the gravy train. He didn't care about if he got a seat at the king's table or not. In fact, after this event, he went and hid out in the cave because Jezebel said, I'm going to come kill you, Jack. It was all about the honor of God. He set things in order. I don't need fakery. I'm not looking for a sound. I'm not looking for a glimmer. I'm looking for fire of God to where there is no, absolutely no possibility of anybody coming in and saying this is fake. You see, when I want to see healings, I want it to be proven medically. They had cancer, instantaneous remission. I want to see people come up out of wheelchairs. Not because they were staged, but because we have on medical record and x-rays that their knees were frozen solid with arthritis. And now they're leaping and dancing and praising God. I want to see people that were strung out on drugs quit cold turkey and never experience one day of withdrawal. But now they're addicted to Jesus. That's what the fire of God does. Even the apostles... Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, there's no biblical record of really of exactly how many were there that witnessed Jesus' ascension. Some believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6. It says, And when he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, uh, most of whom now remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. This is the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Many believe that he was referring to the ascension that 500 saw him go up. 500 saw him go up, then had angels appear, and they give their little speech. The ascension of Jesus, remember we're Pentecost, 40 days infallible proofs. So you go into... Counting the Omer, 40 days, he ascends. The day of Pentecost is just 10 days later. Yet, what I find is there wasn't 500 in the upper room. Maybe there wasn't room for that many, or maybe this people just kind of lost interest. But Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until the power comes, and he didn't tell them in 10 days. I think those that really had a heart for God, they were in it for the long haul. Ten days, ten weeks, ten months, ten years. I'm staying until the power comes. You see, if you have that attitude, the power will come. If you're willing to pay the price and be obedient, the power will come. Now what's interesting about ten... Ten is the number of testimony of law and responsibility. Testimony, they were going to be empowered to be witnesses and to give testimony regarding who Jesus was. On that day, the first time the law was given, first day of Pentecost. This day of Pentecost, the fire of God moved on the inside. The commandments of God were written on their hearts, and now the Holy Spirit gave them the power to live it, 
to be that testimony. And they also took personal responsibility both to testify of Christ and to walk in kingdom, which is the very definition of ministry. Now the effects of the fire of God. And Pentecostals love this. And you shall receive power! Power! Dunamis! Miracle working power. But you know that's not the only definition to dunamis. Do you know that? In fact, the Amplified Translation translates it this way. But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might. When was the last time you saw efficiency in any church? <laughs> Much less ability, they're just kind of winging it. Dunamis, its number one definition, strength, power, ability. Second definition, inherent power. That's something that is going to be released in you that is going to become a dynamo in you, that it's now inherent, it's not external, it's internal. <laughs> Power residing in the thing, the virtue of its nature, the new nature. The new nature has the power, is inherent to the new nature. Next one, power performing miracles. Every Pentecostal said, I'm glad he finally got to that, but it was a little bit down the list, but it's part of the package. Here's some that we have forgotten. Moral power and excellence of soul. A spirit of excellence came on them. You know, the, the apostle that wrote the book of James, and his name wasn't really James, it was Jacob. It was changed to James by the King James people to honor King James. But his name was Yaakov, Jacob. And among his enemies, among the Pharisees that hated him, do you know what his name was? Jacob the righteous. When your enemies are calling you righteous, there's a spirit of excellence there. The same spirit of excellence that came on Daniel came on the church. That's all a part of this empowerment that we're supposed to have. Oh, the power and influence that belongs to riches and wealth. Do you know, wealthy people walk different. You know, one of the things that people had trouble with Donald Trump is he never talked like a politician, he talked like a rich man. You see, a rich man will say what he wants and he doesn't care what you think. Okay? He did. But I've said my, done my dues. So, with the wealth that comes from heaven, we don't have to worry about what the enemy is thinking we just speak God's truth as if we had the influence because we're walking in the riches of heaven. You don't have to have it jingling in your pocket. This shortly after this, we read, Silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. You see, that's the currency of heaven. You're going to get it here in a minute, and this is... You know, one of these things, when it really sinks in, you're going to have a hard time keeping your car on the road. The power and resources arising from numbers. If God is for you, who can be against you? You and God are a majority. There was a time that the prophet of God was surrounded by the enemy, and his servant was freaking out. He said, God opened his eyes. The hills were alive and it wasn't with the sound of music. It was with the sound of chariots and angels about ready to absolutely take out the enemy. And all he had to do was to speak a word. And an entire army at that moment was struck blind. 
And they leaded an army like a puppy dog on a leash because they were blind. That's God's numbers. But Mark, I read that one third of the angels fell. And they're innumerable. You can't count them. There's so many. That leaves two thirds on our side. For every one they have, we got two. And then we have Almighty God living on the inside of us. And then He didn't create an armor for you, He gave you the army that He wore. When he kicked them out of heaven, he put, he put the armor on you that when he showed up in the lower parts of Sheol and the devil found out what hell was all about, he, Jesus was wearing this armor and he made an open show of the enemy and paraded him through and grabbed the keys. It's that armor that he gave to you. And so if the character of Christ has been established, the fire of God is in your eyes, and you're wearing that armor, when you hold your ground, unless you lift that visor and go, Hey there! The devil can't tell between it being you or Jesus. So that is not the time to get goofy and let him know a goofball is clanking around in some armor. But when he sees after you have done everything that you know to do, you stand, you plant those spiked shoes in the ground. You take your ground. You're speaking the word. You're moving in truth. You got up the shield of faith. And you're going to stand until it is over and it is done. Because that's what Jesus would do. When When the devil sees that, hell reconsiders. The power of numbers. In fact, it just doesn't stop there. The very last definition, the power consisting of arresting upon armies, fortress, uh, uh, forces, and hosts. You see, when the, when the king or his representative would go out on the battlefield, he would talk to their guy. You look over their shoulder and there may be 100,000 men ready for battle. I mean, chomping for battle. How many know when you can see not a ragtag army, but a well-disciplined army behind the guy that's walking down front and saying, we're going to negotiate your surrender? How many know that you take that man's words very seriously? And when we are moving and we, we get in that path, it's in that path that the armies of God are revealed. It's in that path of safety. I remember years ago, and I mean, this is going back into the, into the 70s. One man called it the love walk. When you, and he said, it's a narrow path. He said, you may have scorpions and everything on both sides of that path, but they cannot come on the path and they cannot touch you as long as you're walking in that narrow path. It's in that path the devil looks through you and he sees all of heaven behind you to back you up. That's why the apostles could say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And that man was leaping and dancing and praising God. Because that spirit that had bound him up could no longer hold him back. Because that day, what that demon saw was men moving in the power consisting of the forces of heaven behind him. Guys, we've got to have that. Finally, how do we keep the fire? You know, they, they, they questioned that in Huhat, in that great, re, Mor, uh, Mor, Mor, the name just left me, Morovian. I mean, it lasted for over 100 years. John Wesley got saved from all of that. When that fell, they said, how do we keep it? And they begin examining the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, to find out how to maintain that. And they begin setting up an altar for God where there was prayer and there was worship 24 hours a day. 
And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that revival lasted for 120 years. Wow. We can't even get one to last six months. You got to protect the fire. Second Timothy 2, verses 20 through 26. And now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. And so, what, what's the difference between a vessel of honor and a spittoon? The clay worked with the potter. Get into last week, the clay, the clay worked with the potter. He got the junk out so that Jesus could make something of him. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, now flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But, and we could put here, unto the Facebook community, to those in the end time social media, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculation, knowing they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Uh-oh. Kind of walk in love. Able to teach, patient when wronged. Well, do you see what that person said about me on Facebook? I'm launching an all-out assault. I'm going to tell them what I think, and it's going to be so bad that if my grandma could read it, she would blush. I'm going to tell them what for. With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. With gentleness correcting, with gentleness correcting, with gentleness correcting. Why is this so important? If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and that they may come to their senses. Aren't you waiting for a lot of believers to come to their senses? And escape the snare of the devil. But read this last one. Having been held captive by him to do his will. When you get the servant of the Lord must not strive. He must not get in the flesh. The moment that you do, you're walking in the enemy's territory, and you can get so involved in that, not only does he take you captive, you're now doing the bidding and the will of the enemy and no longer the Lord Jesus Christ. I recently had to turn down going to one conference because of some of the things taught because it produces such bad fruit. And I mean, I, I have had some of the proponents of this email me and, and different things. I'm ex-military, okay? I saw things said to me that would make special forces blush. They would align a superlatives this long and then telling me that I need to get right with God or I'm going to go to hell. I think that's quarrelsome. I think that's strife. I think they're doing more to tear apart the body of Christ. And, and see, well, is it, which movement is it? It can be any movement because I've seen the Baptists do that against the Pentecostals. I've seen the Pentecostals do that against the Baptists. I've seen those that don't believe in divine healing do it against those that do. Just pick your topic. It can start out as a move from God, and the enemy will come in, and if we don't stay sanctified, we'll end up being captive doing what he wants done to tear apart the body and skew Scripture and to taint doctrine rather than building up the kingdom. What are we going to have to do? When the fire comes, you've got to guard it. Now, this is not in my notes, but remember when the Apostle Paul said that when the Lord comes, it'll be like a thief in the night? And we Gentiles think of a thief in the night as someone sneaking in the wind at night, going to get your play pretties. Everybody that heard it heard something completely different. Thief in the night 
was a Jewish idiom referring to the service of the priest to maintain the fire of God on the temple mount that God had given. And you would, and how many know that? That's kind of like when you're in the military, you let a private keep the fire going all night while the sergeant major is home asleep in the bed all nice and snug. Well, this, this private, this young priest, would stoke that fire. And he said, boy, this, you know, do you see the size of that log, Harry? That'll burn all night. We don't have to worry about it. And he'd lay out there and he'd fall asleep. The thief in the night was the high priest. He would come as a thief of the night to inspect how they were maintaining the fire. And he would have a pan and a little shovel that he would take with them. And you know, back then, everybody's garments went down all the way to their toes, okay? And that guy would be asleep there, and he would take some of that coal, and he would put it down between his legs on his garments. And that would put the guy in a coma because now he really got warm until there was the inevitable <laughs> And then, because he, th- he talks about the thief is a night, a guy streaking through, everybody is seeing his undoneness. It's because that priest was have, basically became a streaker because his clothes were on fire. And as he's yelling and running through the streets, Mama! Everybody pokes their head out the window and said, What Junior do now? And everybody would see his unpreparedness. And Paul was warning us, I want Jesus to come back. I wish he'd come back right now. I'm ready to check out. I know he has stuff for me to do. And I see the challenges of it. I see the task of it. And if, if, if he wants to use me for the next 30 years, I'm in for the long haul. But if he wants to come now, old Mike Lake is not going to say one gripe. Check me out. You coming back, I'm ready for my glorified body. I'm ready to where I can say, sin, death, hell, can't touch this. Immortal, incorruptible. I can move through all 11 dimensions. I can walk through a wall and not leave a hole. Okay? I'm ready. But when he comes, I want the fire stoked. I don't want it down to where we're having to sit there and go, Do you ever get where they almost let the fire go completely out and there's, there's not even any glow of any embers and you're sitting there blowing and there's ash flying up trying to find something that you can put a little bit of kindling on to get it going again? That's the church right now. He's going to have to get the fire going again. I showed in my last book that the brazen altar in the body has grown cold. The fire's gone completely out. Not only is the altar cold, there's about three inches of dust on it. It's time to break back out the gear. We've got to fill the brazen lever with the Word of God so that we can see what we need to correct. We sacrifice it. We come back. We wash even the, the ash of it off of us. And we now look into the perfect law of liberty to see who we have become. We've got to have that. God is getting ready to pour out a fire that's going to make the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts look like a weenie roast. There is an end time harvest coming. Jesus spoke of it. The Apostle Paul spoke of it. John said, coming out of tribulation, I saw an innumerable number of saints who had their garments washed white as snow. I'd like to just be able to add just a dozen to that, wouldn't you? Have my part in seeing that come to pass because the Lamb needs to receive the labor and the reward, the reward for his labor and the price he paid at Calvary. Jesus deserves a great harvest. 
Heaven needs to be filled. Did you ever, I'm going I'm to end with this. You know how big that harvest is going to be? When we get the new heaven and new earth, that earth is going to be considerably larger than the one that we have now. Have you ever just looked at the city? The city would take up most of the continental United States if you set it down. And then you've got to have gates and roads coming into it and stuff to do when you get on the outside of the city. And then it's sticking almost outside the atmosphere. <laughs> the atmosphere, well, the bigger planet comes with a deeper atmosphere. Just to hold us. And a place the devil has never been. Sin has never touched. There has never been any demon with sulfur breath breathing on a soul in that place. But it's brand new. That he says, there's not going to be even the smell of Egypt on this place. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. But being the priest, we've got to call for the fire, prepare for the fire, and then maintain the fire once it gets here. Because how we maintain it in this generation, we are going to be judged by our high priest on it. And I want him to say, you know, that thing's big enough where we could put probably about nine oxen on it and have a barbecue. Is what I want. That's, that's my heart. And Lord, in my old age, let me see it, I ask. For all of us, Father, in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principality's wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The Kingdom Priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of 
of End Times Prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.